Bienvenidos a todos. Good evening. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And I welcome you tonight to En Casa con La Plaza. La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, as you know, is located downtown Los Angeles. We've been temporarily closed since March of this year. But since then, we've been bringing you these conversations, presentations, demonstrations, and performances from our home to yours, from nuestra casas to your casas. Two, three, four times per week. It's our way of fulfilling our mission of telling the little known stories of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and all Latinos in the founding, growth, and evolution of the LA area. It's sponsored by SoCal Gas and California Humanities. Thank you to them. If you're on Zoom, we have our chat feature. Let us know where you're viewing from. We have our Q&A, ask us questions. We may answer them at the time, we may save them for later. If you're on Facebook, we're live on our Facebook page. Share it with your friends. Start a watch party. Ask your questions or make comments. Tell us where you're viewing from on our comments section there. Tonight we have a very special program. As you know, tomorrow, November 11th is Veterans Day, originally known as Armistice Day. On November 11th, 1919, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson issued the message to his countrymen on the first Armistice Day, which now has known as Veterans Day, which is honoring military veterans. That is people, who, persons who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces and were discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. It coincides with other holidays in other countries celebrating their veterans. And tonight we have a very special program. As you may or may not know, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, since it's been closed, we've been holding back our exhibitions. And one exhibition which we had planned to open up on August 29th of this year was called Patriotism in Progress, Fighting for Country and Comunidad, which was to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. And as those of you who follow Chicano, Latino, Los Angeles history, it was a big, uh, a series of protests against the war. But tonight we are celebrating our Latino veterans. And here we have with us tonight, and I'll introduce each one of them separately. We have Manuel Sandoval, U.S. Army Corps, Vietnam, 1966 to 1967. Hello, Marine Manuel, Corps. how are you tonight? All right, that was Marine Corps. Marine United Corps. States Marine Corps. <laughs> Tell us about a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Okay, I'm uh, 74 years old. I, I, uh, we grew up in uh, Lincoln Heights, uh, northeast of Los Angeles. Back, uh, we moved there in 1960. Went to Cathedral High School. That's a high school about a mile or so from Chinatown, about a mile or so from Dodger Stadium. And uh, well, I was drafted into the Marine Corps in 1966 and uh, served two years there. Went 13 months in Vietnam, served two years in the, in the service. Came home, got married, and wow, there's a lot, there's, I could write a book, there's so much that's gone on in my career, in my life, rather. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks for being here with us tonight. And tonight we also have with us your brother, Tom. U.S. Army, Vietnam, and Cambodia, 1969 to 1970. Come on up, uh, Tom. Let us know a little bit about yourself. Well, part of it is uh, a little bit what my brother spoke about. Uh, actually, as I mentioned to you, Abelardo, uh, before we moved to Lincoln Heights, we lived uh, right in the heart of downtown L.A., um, um, you know, right off what was then Sunset Boulevard between Figaro and a little small street called Boston. Um, like my brother, I, I, uh, we, we went to Queen of Angel Grammar School, which is no longer there. It used to be right next to Chinatown on the other side. And I went to Cathedral High School also. Uh, was drafted into the uh, United States Army uh, in uh, February of 69 and uh, served uh, 
a little short of two years, thanks to President Nixon, who was giving early, uh, early time out in the end of 1970. But I spent uh, a year in, uh, in Vietnam, combat veteran, and uh, worked for 30 years in telecommunications. And I've been retired now for about uh, 12 years. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then we also have with us Tomas Summer Sandoval, an associate professor, history and Chicano Latino studies at Pomona College, and also Tom's son and Manuel's nephew. Come on up, Tomas. Tell us a little bit about yourself. First off, thanks for doing this, Abelardo. It's a real pleasure to, to share the Zoom screen with my Theo and my dad. So. <laughs> and uh, to talk about this subject. So uh, yeah, my name is Tomas, I'm, I'm Tommy Jr. Um, I'm, as you said, a professor of uh, Chicano Latino Studies and History over at Pomona College, which is where I'm calling in from right now. Um, I am uh, I'm obviously uh, not a Vietnam veteran and I'm not a veteran at all, but I, I was born into uh, you know a world where, where it was common for our fathers and Theos and, and others to, to be uh, Vietnam veterans. And so I kind of uh, have my own version of this experience. But then it, when I became a professor, um, it became one of the research topics that I focused on, uh, really trying to bring kind of my professional skills uh, to better understand something that I think is a collective experience for, for our community. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to start with some questions that I drafted and I, and I shared with the three of you. Uh, first of all, this is for Tom and Manuel. Uh, you come, and of course you, Tomas, as well, but you come from families with members who served in the military. Did those family members speak of their experiences? Well, I'm sure my brother can expound on this also. We had an uncle um, who has since passed away. Uh, there was a uh, in World War II, um, Normandy invasion. And when we were kids, right, Manuel? Um, um, I, I would imagine the Second World War um, was powerfully emotionally for moving for all those soldiers that served no matter what capacity. So it wasn't like he walked around, right, Manuel, just saying, hey, let me tell you about right. the war. Right. We kind of, when we first found out and we were you know, little kids, uh, mm -hmm. what he had done, uh, we would ask him questions, and, and, and uh, but it wasn't something that. And then he would tell us, you know, Emmanuel, about like you know, about the invasion and about his 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 period of time over in in in, uh, in Europe, um, and that was the closest we had. We had an uncle also, his brother, our uncle Robert, that was in Korea, um, and uh, he would talk about it. But I think our uncle Frank uh, was the one that related more information about what he actually did. So I'll let my brother talk a little bit about that. Yeah, he, when uh, when I became of age to go to Vietnam, he he that's when he really started talking to me. That's my uncle Frank, and he was in the uh, I think it was the Third Army, and then he he even spoke about they they went into uh, I forget which it might have been uh, Auschwitz. And uh, he saw the dead, the the Jews there in in the in the ovens, and they help he helped take out the bodies and stuff. So he he was kind of traumatized about that. I remember him telling me. But other than that, that's about all we we really talked about. So the, and my dad was never in the service. So the only two that we we knew were in our family was Uncle Frank and Robert. Oh well, uh, Uncle Charlie was in the. Yeah, we had an uncle also. Yeah, uncle, that's right. I, I forget what, I think he was in the Air Corps, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't really know, I know exactly what he did. So we had maybe, we had three uncles who were in the service, mm -hmm. World War II. Well, Manuel, you were drafted in 65. So how did your family react to you, uh, of you uh, joining the Marines? And, and, well, and what, if any, was your view of the Vietnam War at the time? In 65, uh, Around December, I got the the greetings letter from uh, the government saying you. And I, I, I didn't open the letter till around Christmas, because I knew what it was. When I opened it Christmas today, I believe it was Christmas Eve, and it said greetings. You've been ordered to go downtown 10th Street and Broadway, and on the third or the fourth of January of the coming year, which was '66. So I knew I was going going to the service. My parents. 
at that time, the Vietnam War on TV was, uh, it was just, it wasn't that big a thing at the time. I remember I didn't want to go, and obviously, but it, there was really no protesting going on. I think that started like in March of 66. I may be wrong. I haven't done his research on it, but, but I remember most people were like pro, pro the war, you know, pro Vietnam and pro the service and, and everybody was more or less going. I didn't know anybody at the time who had gone into the service at the time. So anyway, when January 3rd came, I said goodbye to my folks and it wasn't like I was going away to camp to them, but they didn't understand. You know, they were, I don't want to say they, well, you know, Tom, what I'm trying to say, they, they, they weren't that cultured in going what was going on in, in the world, so to speak. As a matter of fact, I, when I did, when I was in Vietnam, I used to send letters home. And uh, the address to send letters to me was in San Francisco. Mm. You know, I said, because uh, you wouldn't go send a letter to Vietnam, but it went to San Francisco. So one letter I got from my mom, I remember she told me, oh, mijo, I'm so glad you didn't go to Vietnam, that you're in San Francisco, you know, I said, I said, no, mom, you know, I had to order back. No, 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 you know, the letters don't come. They have to go to San Francisco first. So, so you know, I don't know how it was, how they were reacting to it here, because I guess my brother could, could talk more about that. But uh, yeah, it, yeah, it, uh, it really wasn't that big a deal at the time, you know. Uh, so, Tom, uh, did Manuel, in these letters, did, yeah. I'm sure he described his experiences in yeah. Vietnam. How did it make you feel? You know, it, it, uh, to kind of echo what my brother said, uh, in 65, 66, those years, even earlier, the earlier part of the year, uh, it, it, the individuals were pro-war. You know, we were fighting the communists, so to speak. So the, uh, it, it, uh, while it was in the newscast and so forth and so on, uh, you know, it really didn't start to get uh, ugly, if you will, uh, until 68, 69. Any part of '67 that I remember, um, but yeah, my mom and dad they were uh, concerned, but th there was just some misunderstanding as to uh, what might what, what might be going on. Uh, you know, there, there might have been some questions. Of, you know, what are we doing over there fighting? I didn't have a lot of answers for them. Mm -hmm. I could only go on what um, um, I was reading or hearing. But there was a concern for my brother that, uh, you know, he was in harm's way for the time once it, <laughs> they realized it. <laughs> he was in San Francisco, darn it. Yeah. You know. uh, but um, it was different then, um, you know, and I, I, my brother and I talk about this, and I think I mentioned to you early on, uh, Alberto, that, that I, we can only speak from our experience. I can only speak from what my uh, impression was. Somebody's liable to send a message to you and say, damn it, it was on the news every night and this and that. Right. Okay. Well, I didn't watch it, you know, but uh, it, my impression at that time was it was not how it was um, uh, after he got home, thank God. And then uh, after my time started to approach, I realized, hey, this is you know, this is this is the real stuff going on over there. Right. Right. And of course, right. my brother's letters. Um, um, you know, you know I, the letters, you don't say yeah. too much. You try right. to you, can, you don't say a you. lot. You don't want to scare everybody back no, home. You just, yeah. You know, hey, how's it going? How things, you know, I really didn't write, even write that much. No, know? he didn't. Really, he didn't. What are you going to say, you know? Yeah. Did, so, did, uh, how's everybody at the house? How's everybody home? Everybody okay? That kind of thing. But, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, as, as the war, as the mood changed in the United States and as, um, as the 68, the Tet, and all, as it got really hot and heavy over there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, as they were losing uh, Latinos, parents, mothers, and fathers, certainly knew where their sons were at that particular point. Um, and things started to change. Things, things got a little different. So, sure. Yeah. I got home. I got home in '67, July of '67. So from then on, you started seeing to me a lot more stuff on TV, as my brother mentioned, and then the Ted Offensive in '68 and so forth. And so when Tommy got the the uh, greetings letter, so to speak, from the sir. And I said, oh man, yeah, he's gonna go, my brother's going over. I said, I made it. And I was thinking, oh man, I don't know if my brother makes it, but I really thought that, but, but he did. But by that time, that's when more protests were going on. People were more uh, aware of what was happening in Vietnam. And you saw people, uh, you know, protesting, as I said. And, and a lot of, and as a matter of fact, that's when, uh, 
the Chicano movement started. And, and you saw more in my other brother who passed away. He, he's the one that was in the walkouts at Lincoln High School. And, <laughs> you know, and they walked out. Of, that was in 68 when they walked out. And uh, so that's when the beginning of the Chicano movement and all that started. But prior to that, uh, you know, we, I, I, we really didn't see much on TV. Sure. Uh, but even though, as you say, each, both of your uh, um, experiences were different because you were there at different times, yeah. uh, right. as were other Latino Chicano soldiers. But I'm sure if you could tell me how in general, both personally and in general, how were Latino Chicano soldiers and Marines treated by their fellow soldiers? They come from yeah. all over the U.S., uh, from, from uh, you know, at the time it was dra the draft was going on, so right. still quite a few did have deferments. It really was a, a diverse, uh, uh, a diverse service. Uh, yeah. So well, I, my platoon, my boot camp, rather, when the platoon and my boot camp were all draftees into the Marines at that time, they 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 were inducting people because the the Marines needed more people. They weren't volunteering to go, so. I think they said they needed like 9% or something of, of, of the total. So all of us who went to Camp Pendleton were all inducted into the Marine Corps. And we were all either Chicanos, Blacks from Watts or South LA, and some Whites. But mainly we were all Hispanic and Blacks who went to Camp Pendleton. And then uh, when we all went to Vietnam, all of us got, we were going to Vietnam, we all split up there. And when I got there to Vietnam, the platoon and the company that I was in were a lot of whites, but uh, a lot of blacks as well, but not too many Chicanos. I saw, I met guys who were Puerto Ricans and some Cubans, but they weren't, uh, there, was, there was one who was from LA, it's, uh, that's true, but there weren't too many in, in my experience at, at that time that were there. And I think my brother's was a little different, right? Yeah, kind of. In, in uh, uh, there were a lot of Latinos when I went to basic training at Fort Ord uh, when I got drafted. Um, in, in both basic and then when I went to AIT, which is the Advanced Infantry Training, uh, the 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 funny it's not funny, but that's the word I'll use. Um, they cleaned out Lincoln Heights. Uh, there were several Clo the Clover's a big gang there. Um, uh, I think Diamond used to be a little further, but you got the projects down on Main Street. Uh, I was bumping into guys that, that uh, hey, there's a little uh, Mocoso, or whatever he called himself, Little Froggy, or whatever the guy's name was. And they cleaned it out uh, in 69. Uh -huh. You know, that's enough of these gangs. So they just drafted everybody. And I'd see these guys uh, that, that uh, I'd play with at the playground or play against at the playground or saw at the park. Really? Dances uh -huh. that were going on various places. And so um, they pretty much uh, got everybody that, that, uh, that could speak the native tongue there, you know. And that was like 69, 69. Years. Yeah, they, they, they had really, um, I, you know, it was almost like you'd go running in the morning, you have to run before chow, and you'd see, hey, there's, uh, there's Ramundo, or there's what's his name from uh, uh, over at Lee's Lake or something. So, and the same thing when I got to Vietnam, I didn't, I didn't, um, uh, I got there uh, and the platoon I was with, or the company I was with, they were operating at company size, meaning that all 150 some odd guys would walk around the jungle together. And you can either operate that way or operate it at a platoon, smaller platoon size or company size. And uh, I was the only Latino there. They didn't know what I was. <laughs> I got there and, and uh, they couldn't pronounce my last name. But these are great guys. I'm not, I'm not, you know, putting them down. I, you know, some of these guys aren't alive anymore, but they were great guys uh, and they couldn't pronounce Sandoval. Uh, so uh, some guy said, uh, Salvano, what is that, Salvano? And so he called me, say, hey, Salvano. And I knew it was me. But when I told him what I, they said, what are you? You know, are you Italian? I said, no, no, I'm Mexican. Mexican? You one of those guys that wears those bandanas and the big hat? You know, and I said, no, not all of us. I, I, I happen to be not one of those kind, but they didn't know what a Mexican was. They, they, and uh, these guys are uh, from the South. Uh, right, white guys from Alabama and uh, Mississippi and so yeah, forth. Well, that I did see a lot of white boys. They were a lot yeah. of Okies, uh, a lot of Oklahoma yeah. guys who did not who did not know what I was. Uh, and it was and, and several of them 
became good friends and, and you find out that, uh, uh, well, one thing, uh, several things, but one thing, uh, you grew up in, in East LA, you grew up in Boyle Heights, or you grew up in Lincoln Heights, wherever, and, and um, you think you don't have a lot. And what you have is great, but you, you think you don't have a lot. Then you meet some guys from the South who didn't have nothing. Oh, I mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you start to say, wow, you know, hey, I had it pretty good where I came from. These guys are really, really, really poor. They, they uh, came from farms or, or lived in places that were uh, had dirt floors, you know, even in, in the 60s. So you kind of tell yourself, you know, um, I, I didn't come from a bad place and these guys aren't bad guys. But it was a while before a couple of Latinos joined the company. Um, um, one, both were from Arizona. And, uh, um, but other than that, um, uh, where I was, I can't speak, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I'm not speaking for everybody that was there at the time I was there. Some guys might have got there and were in a whole platoon. I, um, there's several books where you read that, uh, that uh, Latino written that seemed to have been in a whole unit with Latinos. That was great, that, fantastic. That wasn't my experience. Um, it, it wasn't mine either, but, yeah. but when, uh, but people did group according to race, you know, yeah. I remember that. The yeah. blacks would go with the blacks, and Chicanos or the Latinos would stick together and the whites. Mm -hmm. And if there was any tension, if there was any kind of fighting, it was usually the whites and the blacks. Uh, the Chicanos and the blacks that I usually got along where I, where I was, you know, usually. But uh, again, there weren't too many Latinos in, in my outfit. It was nice white guys, a lot of Southerners, a lot of Okies. That was, that's what I experienced. And, I guess the core, not, the core yeah, was... Not that that was bad. You, you, you learned no, how no. to, you turn out to get along with these guys. And uh, one thing that, that we had, several of the guys uh, used to love, well, everybody loved Motown in those days. And yeah. some of these guys used to sing like champs. And I used to like to sing too. And so we'd get out there and try to harmonize all the yeah. Marvin Gaye tunes or, or Temptation tunes. And so you find something that, that um, regardless of your color, um, that you have in common and music, yeah. was, music was one of those I things. Imagine you, you had to, you, you were in a platoon or a company together, you had to protect mm -hmm. yourselves. And so that was, uh, that uh, would lead to that camaraderie, at least yeah. Yeah. to be able to survive it. Exactly. exactly. Uh, we have a, a question, a comment here from a Brittany Walker Pettigrew. She says, ah. my, uncle, my uncle served in Vietnam, was killed in action in 67, she believes. He had been a career Marine. Her father, who was rejected from the draft, said that he felt like the Vietnam War cleaned out the community where he lived in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. There, was no, there were no black or Latino young men left in the early years. And mm -hmm. you did speak to that about yeah. that. That's what yeah. you saw in your community as well. Yeah, I would say that uh, uh, from, from my experience and certainly the gentleman that, that uh, um, um, gave that information, it, they did at a certain point. Um, they weren't home anywhere. Everybody was, was somewhere else, uh, but they weren't oh. back in the hood. You know? And not that I you know, was a tough guy in the hood, but I'm just saying you, you see people in the neighborhood and then you realize when you see them running around out in a training field or in the chow line or something, you go, whoa, how many of us did they get here? You know, yeah, they did. At, at that point, at least when I was there also, I, I think they just said, hey, we're drafting everybody that, uh, that that's draft eligible. And uh, that's what they did. That's what the government did. So, yeah. Sure, and, and, uh, and just having spoken to, to people involved with the, with the anti-war protests with the Chicano moratorium at the time, that was one of their, uh, their biggest issues is the fact yeah. that uh, the Chicano Latino men uh, mm -hmm. were being drafted and then sent over uh, to Vietnam in, in bigger numbers uh, than, the, than our, the proportion of our population. Mm -hmm. There's a, there, statistically, I don't have the numbers. My son, I, I read a book and it, when sometimes I read it, I have to read it two or three times before it sticks in this head anymore. But statistically there, there's, um, um, I forget what the term is, son. Um, it was the um, working man's war. Is, is that it? Am I using the right term? Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, um, we were all the sons of, of, um, of the working class. Um, I, I, should, I should qualify that, I, not all, but uh, the numbers at that point statistically will bear it out. The, the, and there were large numbers of working class sons of working class fathers and mothers uh, and, that were waging war. So it, it uh, but, but you know, 
this the stuff that we talk about like that it, these statistics came out much later you know yeah. i mean you know now you look back and, and a lot of stuff i didn't even know at the time but you know when you look you google something how many chicanos died in vietnam or or uh, was it disproportionately sent rather than the, you know the blacks and so forth but at the time at the time none of this was in my head at least i, yeah. I never I didn't look around and say, God, there's more Chicanos here than anybody else. I, I tell you, you know, it, that wasn't in my mind. And, and like I say, not, even the, the moratoriums and when I used to see them picketing, when I came back and I saw the guys pick, I would say, what the hell are they long haired dudes picketing? You know, and I, it, I was kind of, I was against it. You know, I didn't like it. it. To me, they were cowards, that to me. But, and again, after reading and after maturing and looking back and you can see that they did help in the war and all these protests and so forth but at the time you know i, I didn't think of this i don't know if you I, did if you were thinking about yeah, I, I, how many not, chicanos were there yeah, how what, many were dying i didn't even think yeah, of that. especially when you're in a combat situation uh you don't have a lot to think about politically other than uh, than hoping that you get up tomorrow morning and and uh, that you're alive and the guy is next to you is alive but i i did in uh the moratorium uh, in August of 70, huh? Um, yeah, you were over there. At that I was time. there. I was in Vietnam. And I remember Gacho, uh, um, um, we called him, whatever, you know, then handed me a Time magazine and said, you're from L.A., man. Aren't you from L.A.? And I said, yeah, yeah. Look what your people are doing to your city, you know. And there was a little, uh, um, uh, it probably was that, that big in a section of Time magazine and spoke to how the, the Mexicans were burning down LA in, in a protest against the war. And it, it might've said a few other things, but it didn't say what they were protesting. I got the feeling that, the pro, that I'm included in that protest for the war. You know, there, there was, they didn't, made no differentiation in that article. Nowadays, certainly you'd say that, you know, what, what are they really marching for? Well, it was just a statement of that uh, they were uh, throwing rocks at the police and so forth and so on. But so I'm sitting there going, well, what the heck, you know, do they know I'm over here? You know, well, why are they protesting me being over here? You know, it, it was almost like, I never heard anybody call me a baby killer, but it's almost like you, you got that label of, of uh, doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. And it wasn't until I wrote back and, and home and, and, uh, I think I wrote my brother and he might've said, ah, wait till you get home and you, know, you don't need to worry about all that right now, you know, <laughs> or, or uh, um, you know, I think I wrote, uh, I was married then uh, to my, my current wife, um, my only wife of 51 years. <laughs> and I wrote to her and said, you know, what are these guys doing, man? I'm fighting over here. Not man, but what are you doing over there, dear? I'm, I'm, I'm fighting this war and these guys are protesting the fact that I'm over here and, had, and so had that article explained what that walkout was all about, I might have had a different outlook on this thing, but I thought, I'm brown, man, you know, I, I, I'm, what are you protesting me being here, which is totally. So that's all the, the um, um, news, if you will, or, or information that I received. And, and really, I, I think I'd put the magazine down, everybody up and move out. And I, you know, made sure I had my, my stuff to go. And you just don't, it, it wasn't, uh, those kinds of little things you didn't have time for over there. You really didn't, you know. Um, when, when I when I got home in '67, and, and uh, I came home July of '67, and uh, I would go out to the clubs and stuff, try to meet people. You know, well, girls, not guys, try to meet <laughs> girls. <laughs> and uh, they would look at your head. Was you know, it was shaved because I was still in in camp. I hadn't been discharged from the service yet. And I would tell them that, that I just got out of the joint, you know, because if you told them that you were in the service, well, they didn't even want to talk to you, you know. You, you were a Vietnam vet, they thought you were crazy. And I mean it, and I, when I say it, I, would, I went for some job interviews and the, the bosses would look at you and say, hey, you know, you're a Vietnam vet, are you okay? I mean, you got nightmares and stuff like that. And they, they really were treating you that way. And then the movies that came out in 67 and 68, all the, all the Vietnam vets that showed, they were all crazy, you know, with guns and trying to kill people. So that was a perception that people had of the Vietnam vet at that time, you know. So then when a lot of the protesters were protesting the, the war and marching against the war and picket signs and stuff, 
it did anger me because my brother was over there. You know, Tommy was over there. And I said, man, my brother's over there and these fools over here are marching. They're cowards. They don't want to go over to, to Nam. You know, this is the way I looked at it, you know. I mean, it's been, uh, and a, a few of the brown berets, I, I knew of them and I, I knew who they were and some of them I, I knew as well. So, I mean, it, I didn't, I didn't care for it at the time. And then like, when they started walking out of the schools and our younger brother, Danny, was involved in that and he started walking out. And then they were putting in the paper that all the kids were for and against the war. It was not, they were just walking out of school just to get out of school. You know what I'm saying? Just, they didn't want to stay in school, so they walked out. You know, it's Lincoln High School was one of the big ones. But uh, people put a lot of, I, I read nowadays and a lot of emphasis that so many people were against the war at the time and so many people were marching. I think it was bull, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to put it. You know, it, it I, didn't, I didn't see all that at, at the time, you know, and this is with my eyes looking back, but yeah. my brother was over there and I didn't want him to get killed. And, and it offended me that people were marching against that war that he was over there fighting. And I had just come back from, you know. You know, part of- uh, Thank you for uh, saying that. I had a, uh, when I got out of high school in 66, I had a lot of friends from Lincoln High School. I mean, we used to play at Lincoln Park together and so forth and so on. So. Uh, you kind of get a flavor for what they're going through. We had, my brother and I had, uh, uh, we both went to Cathedral High School, Catholic High School. Uh, my dad worked hard to, to put us in that school. Good education. Uh, but we had a, we had not to, not to lord over anyone, but and not that we're any better than anyone, but we had a pretty good education. And so the issue, uh, I know a lot of the issues were that they didn't have the right books and, and, and all that was true, but we didn't have that issue in high school. So you have to be able to, to, um, to relate to their issue, that, that part of it, that they weren't getting a good education. And that was all true. And I learned that from, from uh, uh, even being our brother, uh, you learned that, you know, what are you doing home? Ah, they ain't teaching anything over there. I'm gonna, <laughs> here I am kind of thing. That was, you know? that was Danny, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, God rest his soul. He, he just, you know, that, that um, he, he would be the closest thing to what, to filling into us what was going on at the high school. Yeah. They're not teaching me anything. They're not. We got these old books that are here and that. So for my brother and I, uh, uh, and not that it wasn't happening, but it's difficult to relate to that when you know you've had a good education. You had all the. I mean, the books we had to buy them. Mm -hmm. I, but so so you knew you had to study something. And my dad was paying tuition for the both of us. So um, so from that standpoint, um, uh, to say that. Uh, uh, we could relate to that aspect of, of why they walked out the poor education. So we didn't have that that experience. It was very true to them, and, and those things were happening, um, rightfully so. From from listening to our younger brothers, so right. so from that standpoint, it, it took me when I got back uh, um, to see what was happening politically at that point uh, in, in our neighborhoods and and to, in, in all the schools were around where, where we all grew up, all these guys, all our friends, you know, that, that uh, the friends that I had that, that, and there are some that, that my son knows uh, that did get involved in, in, in a lot of that movement at that time, uh, uh, politically took up arms and picket signs and so forth and so on and walked out there. I, I admire these guys that, that did that. Um, but that was the flavor of what was going on when I was there, what I was hearing, and then when I got home, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's it's hard to talk about stuff that 50 years ago. You know, what I mean, because you can't, people can't relate to it. You know, whoever's listening right now and they say, well, you know, what are these guys? But that, like, in, that's in a second to me. Like, it's like I went to sleep and woke up, and all of a sudden I'm here. You know, but that was a long time ago. You know, and we were younger then, and our minds were in thinking about different things at the time, and. And now when I look back at that stuff, it's like, it, it, it is like crazy times to me, you know, like, that was the 60s, you know, the revolution time, you know, people smoking weed, people, the music, uh, you know, uh, Monterey Pop, when did you went to the Monterey Pop, right? And, uh, yeah, the Monterey Pop Festival. I was, in, I was in Nam at that time when you went to the Monterey Pop Festival. I remember you, you wrote me about that. Yeah. So that was the hippie movement at that time, love and and all that. When I got back, see, I didn't. I missed that part, man. But <laughs> you, <laughs> you did go to the flower child parties. Uh, you, know, you, you didn't miss a lot. Because <laughs> 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 my wife's listening upstairs. So. <laughs> well, let me bring in. Let me bring in. Go ahead, Tomas, if you please, uh, Tomas. Uh, uh, so, so you're. 
what what brought about your professional interest in this in this era in this in this uh, part of U.S. history that that your both your father and your uncle were involved with? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's personal. <laughs> I, I grew up in a world where where my father, where my tío, where I mean, a lot of the friends that I had in school, a lot of their fathers were all Vietnam vets, right? You get to the point where every other adult male that I knew growing up uh, was a, was a Vietnam vet. And, you know, I just thought it was a, a normal part of, of everybody's history. And, you know, as I, you know, go off to college and, and graduate school and start to learn more about this history, I realize, well, that's not the case at all. Right. Not even for this generation as, as a whole, this, this generation. And in my work, I talk about them as the Brown baby boom, the Latinos who are born in that baby boom period of the late forties. Even the first generation of uh, folks who are going up to Vietnam are born about the time of World War II. But, but this generation uh, broadly, as they came of age, you know, the Vietnam War hung over them as this, as this you know, cloud, this, this fear that they all had that they were going to get drafted. But very few did. Only 10% of that generation served in Southeast Asia in the U.S. wars in Southeast Asia. Only 10%. And it's Definitely. obviously, that's when you start to, to realize, well, there's, there's an important story here that, that isn't being told, right? To better understand why our communities uh, got disproportionately pulled into this war. And what does that mean? What does that say about our history? What does that say about, about uh, that period in, in the United States? And so as a historian, that's, that's, that's a, a good topic right there. And like, like everything in the world of Chicano studies, it's, it's, it's all rooted to my own personal experience to start off with. Right? Sure. Well, with, uh, based on the oral, history of, oral histories of other Latino Vietnam vets that you've conducted, I'll, I'm sure, of course, your father and your uncle's experience were, were much different than theirs. But what is there like a, a, a thread that connects their experiences that you have found? Yeah, and, and I, I'll echo that of what both, both of your, your guests here have said is that most veterans are really cautious about speaking for other veterans. And there's a, a, a very real uh, sense and then a reality uh, to this sense that uh, there is no single kind of experience about Vietnam. Right? When vets meet each other, they often, I've had this story told to me so many times that uh, what's important to them is when did you serve, where did you serve, and what did you do when you were there, right? And that gives, uh, that's a reflection of that kind of internal sense of their own diversity of experience. But part of the beauty of oral history, first, is just to, to get our history told, right? We're, we're, generally speaking, Chicano Latino history is usually not understood. It's erased while it's happening. Our experiences and roles in this country have often been ignored and erased. And so the first part about oral history is just to record our own stories, to record our stories so that we can save them for future generations to understand. We were here and we did this. Right? But the other beautiful part about oral history is when you do it right and you collect enough you start to get the picture, not just of one individual, another individual, and so on, but a generation, right? A community, a people. And inside of those oral histories, a lot of common themes come out. And some of them are coming out even in the, in the stories that my uncle and my dad are telling already about a generation who are born into this beginning of the Cold War and how they're being raised in this post-World War II era with a strong sense of patriotism and nationalism, with a strong faith in what the government is doing to protect you, you know, from the communist threat. And that, those are all, and a whole bunch of, you know, everything from, from movies, you know, that are glorifying war and, and, you know, even TV shows like Superman and the Lone Ranger, you know, they give you a sense of what, what duty and obligation is for a male. Right. And even in school, you're learning a lot of this. And in church, you know, the Catholic Church is is a big part of, you know, the weekly services are about, you know, praying for the people under communist rule. You know, um, it's, it's all preparing you for this sense of duty and a male obligation. And and it's the kind of recipe for building a generation that that is going to go off and and be asked to do these kinds of things and then do them. Right. 
And at the same time, you see that that's a generation that often doesn't know a lot about uh, what's happening in Southeast Asia. And, and that's the other sort of interesting story, right? A lot of veterans who, who, when they're young men are going off into this war and the world they come back to is very different. The understandings that they have when they left are very different than the understandings they have when they come back. And, and then there's the, the community story, right? I mean, we had talked about letters. Um, it's not just a story, it's not just their story, but every day that they're over there, there are, you know, one, two, 10, 20 more people over here who are spending their every day thinking about them, right? Who are thinking about them every day, who, who for them, this is a life or death issue every day inside of East LA, right? And what does that mean for that period of time, right? For this whole decade that, that connects in this really unusual way communities, you know, barrio communities, you know, in, in San Antonio, Texas, and, you know, in rural parts of the Southwest, or in places like East LA, you know, for a decade, East LA is so intimately connected up to halfway around the world in Southeast Asia. And what does that mean? And what does that mean for the Chicano community who is over here? And so those, those kinds of things are some of the questions and some of the things that come out in those oral histories, both I've, for 10 years now, I've been collecting oral histories, not just with Chicano Latino vets, but also their family members. Um, also more recently, people like me, the children of uh, Chicano vets too, to get that, that overall picture as well. Sure, and from these, uh, these oral histories, you have, uh, you've compiled a, a public history exhibit and you've written a play. Could you tell us a little bit about those two, please? Sure, well, you know, academic, historians like you know the big thing we do is write books and that's what I'm working on with mm -hmm. these right now but for me I felt it was really important to do other things before that book right and to to really find ways to to present back the kinds of research that I do to the people who lived it right I mean part of what we're talking about is a whole history that we all know is is been largely erased Right. Even, even in the United States, as they started to come to terms with their history in Vietnam, and as you started to see some understanding of, of veterans' experiences enter into like the mainstream, you know, through movies or TV or even politics, um, you don't see Chicanos as a part of that, right? You, you don't see the, the kinds of, of representation of what people experienced in their daily lives being projected back at you. And so it's important that when uh, any of us as, as Chicano, Chicana historians, when we collect uh, a, a, a knowledge about the past, that we find ways to share it with, with our own communities. And so the first thing I did with it was, yeah, as you mentioned, a public history exhibit, uh, bringing art and the oral histories together um, in an exhibit uh, for a couple of months. And then the next thing was a play. And the play is based on oral histories. It was performed about two years ago in LA and the Boot Lake Theater um, and a couple of other places since then. And it's, uh, I took about two dozen uh, of the oral histories and created characters out of, out of their stories, blending them together, making composites. And it tells the story of, uh, hopefully, of a generation through the, the lives of two women and four men. Uh, who are sort of um, giving their own testimonial uh, throughout the play. All right, and uh, Tom and, and Manuel, what, what have you learned from, from Tomas's uh, uh, studies and, and what he's presented uh, uh, beyond your personal experiences? I'll let my, my brother speak. Well, uh, I, you know, when, when, I, when I first heard that Tom was doing this, this is a few years back, and uh, I said, man, that's a lot for him to do. But then when I saw the play and I, and I read a couple of his books that, he, that he's done and, and the transcripts and so forth, I'm proud of him, you know? And I've learned, a, and you know, the main thing is you learn that a lot of guys, no matter our experiences were different, we all have the same sort of more or less feelings, you know? You come back from the, from the war and you just close up, you know? You just keep it to yourself, you just, go back into society and you get a job or you get married and so forth, but you never really talked about these things, you know? As a matter of fact, a cousin of ours, Bella, she, uh, she was married to a, a Marine who was during the Tet Offensive. 
and he uh, he was in the Fifth Marines. And when he came back, he and I used to talk. And uh, he started one of the first uh, counseling groups. I remember when uh, and and uh, talking to vets and trying to get vets to you know, with with post traumatic stress disorder and so forth. And there wasn't even a word for it at the time when I got back. They made up that name a few years later. But he was one of the first who started getting vets together and talking. And, and I, I went to a couple of those those meetings and, and they were lethargic, you know, not lethargic, cathargic rather. And uh, so that, that the kind of stuff that Tom, my nephew is doing is kind of like the same thing. You know, you, you'll read about what other vets went through and you say, wow, it sounds like me, you know, or I wasn't alone. That, that's that that what you. That's the kind of things that you get from that, you know. Yet everybody's experience was different, which is true. But yet it's it's all like an accord, you know. I'm trying to say it's you're all kind of experiencing, in a sense, some of the same loneliness or fear or isolation or disrespect when coming back. That kind of thing. I think most of us felt that. That and that's what I, I do get from from Tom's, uh, especially the play. I, I love that play when I saw it, and that it, it, and you were kind of in, Tom were involved in some of these too as well. And yeah, I, I, I was proud. You know, and I'm saying I'm sounding like I'm proud of it, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. I'm proud of I'm proud of my brother and his son. You know, I mean, they've done a lot. They really have. And, yeah. and, uh, and we anyway. have a question, we have a question here from uh, from Adele. Uh, Andrade Stadler asking, what's the title of the, of the play? And, and uh, do you have a title for the book that you're writing? The title of the play is called uh, Ring of Red, a barrio story. Um, and the book is not officially titled yet, but right now the title is On the Edge of Things. Uh, and uh, Mario Valdez, Valadez is asking, uh, first of all, thanks for sharing your experience experiences to Tom and Manuel. Uh, which books, and, and maybe Tomas could answer, which books do you recommend uh, on Chicano Vietnam vets? Ah, that's a great one, question. Yeah, w one book I'd recommend, it, it doesn't so much deal with Latinos, but Tim O'Brien's What They Carried is, is, is a good book, excellent book to read, Tim O'Brien. But uh, back to my son, I'm sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to step on you. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to mention that. It's a, it's a, a a go-to book. Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to Chicanos, um, uh, specifically, there's a man, Charlie Trujillo, who mm. for the biggest part of the 80s and 90s was a one-man show on keeping this history alive. And Charlie Trujillo's book, Soldados, is a really good small oral history. Um, he also made a documentary movie uh, that, that's uh, really good. Um, also kind of <clears throat> testimonial style, people telling their stories, the guys he grew up with in Corcoran. Um, there's a, um, a book by a, a journalist uh, named Lea Ibarra, um, and it's called uh, Vietnam Veteranos, um, and it's an oral history book as well. Um, there haven't been any real historians uh, who, any real history books uh, about uh, Chicano vets in participation in Vietnam. I, uh, uh, beyond those those kinds of oral history books, uh, people writing their own. Uh, there's a book by a guy named uh, Eddie Maureen and um, a few others of vets who wrote their own story, you know, memoirs. Um, but uh, mostly in Chicano studies, there's been a lot more focus on the anti-war movement part of it than than on those who who went. So, but there are things out there. All right. Well, uh, from Rudy Gomez, a uh, USMC. Uh, he says uh, that we should watch on the internet. He has a, a, a 41 minute interview called Vietnam veteran Rudy Gomez. So uh, that's something that, that you might want to look into. Uh, we have uh, quite a few comments here. Uh, let's see, uh, Denise Sandoval, uh, a, a fellow professor. Uh, she's saying that Doc Soldados is on YouTube. So, so everybody could, could check out that one. Uh, are they aware? Nancy De Los Santos, are you aware of Voces at UT Austin? Are you aware of that? Of Voces? Yes. No, I don't know. Okay. Well, she also says it took years for her brother to talk about Vietnam. So that's something that, as you say, uh, you know, it takes. I I I have a um, a cousin-in-law who did serve in Vietnam, and and uh, I've asked 
you know, questions about him, but again, somebody re reluctant to, to share those experiences. Uh, I have uh, my sons, two of them, they, they, and maybe this is kind of parallel to the Iraq, you know, the, the desert storm in Iraq, where uh, although the draft was over, it was many uh, Chicanos, Latinos who did uh, uh, choose to, to enlist and there was protest uh, of their involvement, uh, mm -hmm. uh, though not as intense as Vietnam. But, uh, yeah. but again, you know, difficult for, for uh, soldiers, uh, Marines, <coughs> to speak of experiences, um, you know, due to, the, to just the conditions, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, can, it, can be, it can be a very difficult thing for, for anybody, obviously, and it's not something that I ever, I've, I mean, I've interviewed over, you know, 60, 70 vets at this point, um, just did one online a month ago. Uh, for the first time too, and always willing to do them, but it's never been something that I try to talk people into, right? Sure. It's a very personal decision for for men to make, and and you know, many I I think at a certain point find it cathartic, but that's not for everybody, certainly. Mm -hmm. But if if you are one of those vets, you know, no matter who you are, it, you you might think you're you're not exceptional or you're not special, but um, you know, your story is important. And it's important for us, uh, if we can, to get a record of that story. And I would say reach out. Um, there's, there's a group, there's an organization through the Library of Congress called the Veterans History Project. There are people all over the country, all over our communities. Usually every congressional office uh, has people who are interviewing vets to contribute to that collection. Everyone who I've ever interviewed for this project has have been under, under that, the protocols of that collection. So... Um, it's an important thing to do if you can. Okay, uh, let, let's bring it to, to recent uh, events. Uh, and, and for all the, the, the three of you, how do you view the recent protests uh, calling for racial justice? And do you see any correlation with the, with the anti-war protests? Or, or, yeah, if you could share that. Well, I think I mentioned, uh, we were talking before we came on, uh, and I was watching uh, just the other night, and you can watch anything from the, black and white from the late 60s, any of these, any of these uh, they were talking about uh, Harlem specifically, and it was a real good um, um, documentary, uh, but, no, no but, but part of, the, part of the film were the protests that took place in the late 50s, early 60s, obviously for, for civil rights and so forth and so on. And it's just interesting and sad in one sense, the signs that they're walking with, and especially the ones in the 60s, uh, send our troops back from Vietnam, stop police brutality, give us the vote. It's the same, part of my language, the same damn stuff that's going on now. When is that, when, when do we stop seeing, you know, the, those same protests? Let's fix this thing. So some of that is, is um, um, it, it's difficult to understand that these protests have been going on for a long time and, and either, some, either we're not listening uh, or just repeating the, 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 the wrong things that we're doing and not addressing what we need to be doing. So from that standpoint, um, uh, I, I get angry when I see that, that kind of, of uh, uh, why, why can't we fix this kind of thing. So. I, I, I agree with my brother, everything he said. There's a, I, not too long ago, I saw an old episode of Dragnet, okay, the old cop show, right? And I swear, if you, if you were to see it, they're, they're dealing with the same issues that we are dealing with, police brutality, you know, the blacks getting beat up and, and killed and so forth, and drugs, the same, the same thing that's going on now. It's like the same people who, who write the signs. It's the same guy who wrote the signs back in the 60s, you know. It's like he's still around writing these signs. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, I swear to you. And they're going to be protesting 10, 20 years from now because there had, you know, if you look back, there has been gradual changes. There's a, you know, there has been a, well, there been a lot of big changes, as a matter of fact. But as much as things change, things still remain the same. You know, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I look at it, the news now, and it's like I'm looking at the 60s. I'm looking back when I was growing up. It is the same, the same thing. And uh, I don't know what that says about society. I guess we never really truly change, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. 
So, so uh, one question here, uh, what lessons can be learned about Latino service involvement in Vietnam and Latino activism against it? That uh, I would think you, you, can't, um, uh, you can't stay quiet. You know, you can't stay quiet. And, and I mean, there, there's, um, the numbers speak for themselves. Individually, nobody's gonna listen to you, but there's power in, in, in numbers. And I guess the, the, it's not an answer, but, but uh, you just have to keep, um, keep at it. You have to keep opening your mouth. You have to keep addressing issues. Even if they're the same thing, uh, uh, you know, I, I would hope that, uh, that something gets done, but we're a couple of old guys saying, yeah, that's the way it was back in the 60s. I don't want to sound like that old guy that says, get off my lawn, you know, put that poster down. But, you know, it, it is, it, some things don't change. So you would hope that, that uh, without listening to a bunch of old guys, that you, you take up, you know, take up these causes, take, take, start fighting for, your, for yourself, number one. And that, that there's there's power in numbers and and it's just got you got to continue got to continue yeah thank you I think what he said yeah you're right in what you're saying I I want to see I've always I've always said that that I want to see more rasa on TV you know yeah. I've all I don't know how many times I've said that <laughs> and uh, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, the African Americans they they have a lot of shows with a lot of African Americans in the shows but when do you see you know, Jorge or Manuel or Tom in, in, a, in a show you don't, you know, that's what gets me. So that, that I think we should be fighting to get more of us on TV, you know. I did the protesting and stuff, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe get behind a cause, it's good to get behind a cause or whatever, but I mean, things will, I don't know, to me things will, don't change, you know. And, 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 I just want to see more of us in the in the cinema, on TV, and doing stuff that my my nephew here, Tom, does. You know that kind of thing. Get active and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, I you know I think when when people start marching and start doing pickets, to me you get people against you. You know, I don't know. You get people saying, Ah, look at the look at those Chicanos again marching, and you know what do they want? You know, I mean that's I hear stuff like that. So. I don't know. That's my opinion. You know. Tomas, do you have anything? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question, right? It's, a, it's kind of the, the, the question I think that's embedded in all Chicano studies. And for me, the lesson is, you know, we're a people collectively who, for most of the history of this country that we've been involved in, are always seen and framed as the outsider, are always framed and seen as the foreigner. And it's hard to it, it it's hard to make that argument of you know over time um, when you have generations that aren't even immigrant right that are born here and then where you have generations who are integrated in all these big parts of this country's history Latinos have been a part of every single war in United States history from the American Revolution to the present right today there's not one person in the United States who didn't need at least one thing that wasn't planted you know, processed, picked, packed by brown Spanish speaking hands, right? We are this outside population and yet we are without us, uh, without our inclusion in this country, people don't eat. Without our inclusion inside of the military, uh, these political priorities that we value so much about things like national defense don't get done, right? And this is a critical period where, where Latinos are being really integrated in, in big ways into the country, but at the same time, still push to the sides and push to the margins. And that to me is the big lesson of this story. And then of course, you know, today, because of Vietnam, today, you know, we have an all volunteer uh, army, an all volunteer military rather. And that volunteer force is smaller and smaller and affecting now less and less of the population, right? Being a vet, being a combat vet is a really exceptional experience now, right? Where most people don't know a combat vet anymore. And, and that's because the share of veterans is going down, but that's not true inside of every community, right? Like mm -hmm. down the block from where I am right now, you know, there's a whole community of Pomona, you know, where you can, or in others that you can drive around and you see everybody who's serving right now and they got a poster up about them. And you can see inside of those communities, it's still a very real thing, right? And so 
the other lesson is to remember that while we've found ways to minimize the the impact of of these the these kinds of sacrifices in in society as a whole there's still parts of our communities all over the place that are disproportionately now even more so affected mm -hmm. and it's important for us to understand that all right thank you well thank you very much to the three of you this has been an incredible uh, discussion and and uh, platica and we have a lot of people here who have uh, who are thanking you uh, Adela Andrade Stadler saying Latinos are America we voted in big numbers to change the course uh, we have Edmund Fimbres who did serve in Vietnam and he stated that it was it's been hard for him to to talk about it himself so uh, now he's saying if I had a son I would tell him not to go into the service especially if there's a war going on uh, you know, this is a, a, a you know, a, an issue that, you know, for at least the, the, a, a flashpoint was 50 mm -hmm. years ago on August 29th when, when the, when the Chicano moratorium, one of the, one of the marches of the Chicano moratorium took, took place that really brought this to the forefront of people's consciousness, but it is, it's been playing out over the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a request here from Esperanza Sanchez, who is uh, uh, the co-curator for the exhibit that I was talking about at La oh, Plaza de Cultura y Artes, which we're planning, uh, called Patriotism in Progress. She, first of all, thanks you all for sharing your experience in serving in Vietnam and for conducting research on Chicano ver veterans and for being part of our upcoming exhibitions. Tom, can you please share about your photographs that you took while you were in Vietnam? Uh, hi, Esperanza. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I, I was married uh, when I went to Vietnam, and um, I would write, she'd write, and I, I was very fortunate to have um, tons of letters. I would get letters, everybody, I think the, the guy that delivered the leche in the neighborhood was writing letters to me over there. Um, but of course, you can't carry all those letters, so I had to burn them. They, they tell you, you have to burn them. They, they, you, the only thing you need to carry with is your ammunition, your water, and the food you're going to eat. So you can't be carrying anything extra. But my wife saved um, 152 letters that I wrote home. Uh, I know that because they're right upstairs. There. 152 plus every little card I, I sent home, you know. And uh, so there is a story there in those letters. I wrote, um, uh, I, I wasn't one of the actors in my son's play. And uh, which was, uh, again, I, I'm very proud of what he did. Uh, and that, that play was somewhat cathartic for me also. But um, the letters, I wrote a, um, several years ago, uh, a, a solo piece and I've performed it several times and I used bits and pieces from those letters to, uh, to form the character that, 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 uh, uh, that I was when I did that piece. But, I have 152 letters upstairs, starting with the very first one when I got to Vietnam. And, um, or the letters rather that I wrote home and she would say, and that can chronicle or that, that do chronicle, not that can chronicle. And, and it's very interesting not to get into a long uh, winded discussion about the psyche and, and psychology, but you start to see in some of those letters, uh, I'm not the real happy guy that's writing <laughs> the letters initially. Uh, it, there becomes a, a um, it's almost a different person writing uh, back as, as things um, uh, just develop and as I changed, uh, had to change my mindset. Uh, it's almost as if there's a, there's a, a statement, um, someone would ask, uh, and this is there in circles, when did, uh, when did the guy that got there leave, you know? And there's a part, there's, and, and the answer to that is, uh, for me was anyway, the first time I received contact, the first time I was in my first firefight, uh, the Tom that got there, little Tommy that got there to Vietnam, got up and did one of these to me and said, hey, you know, I'll see you later. We'll, we'll catch you, we'll catch you, we'll catch you when you get back. And, and I was left, I know this is all, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's part of what, um, uh, I was left there, and this is the guy that came back, and maybe ever since then, and I don't know how my brother feels, we've talked about this. Uh, you find yourself trying to find that guy. And and uh, there's times when, when you think you found him, that, that young guy that went over there, and there's times that you just know you're, you're never gonna find him, you know? 
You're never going to get back to that. And that's what we, we and a lot of other veterans and, and any other veterans that are on the call right now, welcome home. Tomorrow's Veterans Day. Welcome home to Vietnam veterans. Because you find your life um, uh, pursuing that kid that got up and, and, and said, I, I didn't sign up for this and, and, and walked away. It's, it's a mindset. It's a change. So, um, so those letters kind of chronicle that story. And, and, and uh, um, my son, uh, I used a portion of, of, of that experience in the play, but I was also honored to, to uh, use um, interviews that he did with kids, uh, kids, guys, kids that I went to high school with, grammar school with, that, that went to Vietnam also. A good friend of mine then, David Lopez, I, I got a chance to use some of his, as did some of the other actors also. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Ring of Red, I wanted to real quickly say what that is. When I left Vietnam, uh, and it was my time to go home, uh, you, you, you know, you're dirty and everything else. I took a shower and, and I maybe took two showers. Then you, then you get back to, to Long Bin, where it's a big army base or military base, where you're going to catch your flight to go back home. And so I took a shower there and they give you a nice clean uniform and, 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 uh, uh, you, you fly back to the States and you go to Oakland and, and you're, you're there processing out for a few days. As I said, I knew I was going home because Nixon cut the, the, the troop buildup. So I got about six or seven months off of what I normally would have had to do. And wow. uh, took a shower, got a clean uniform, medals hanging here, stripes and so forth. And I got home. My wife was waiting for me. And I told my wife, I want to take a bath. I haven't taken a bath in over a year. So we she put some candles along the side of the tub and I laid down and I opened my eyes after a while and there was a ring of red floating around the edge of the tub. So that meant all the showers I took before coming home, that red clay was in my pores, you know? And that's why that, that there's a statement that I used and it wasn't mine that you might leave Vietnam, but Vietnam never leaves you. And I realized at that point, I mean, it, the clay did come off, but that's what the ring of red referred to, uh, you know, and then maybe it never comes off, you know, maybe there's, you, you deal with things as you get older. That's why I, I love anytime anyone wants to talk to me or talk to us about these kinds of things. Uh, you got to get to us before we start to get too old. And, <laughs> and then the stories will look like we're fighting Martians from outer space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, was that the story, Manuel? He's going to tell me, no, I think they were from the moon. You know, it, it, the yeah, stories yeah. are going to change here in another 10 years or so. So, you know, I just appreciate anyone that, that uh, wants to listen to a couple of old guys just, just talk about our lives. You know, I, I read recently not, that 380 Vietnam vets die a day. You know, a day, and they said that most of us would be dead in ten years by like the numbers go. And I don't know how true that is, but like a thousand World World War Two vets die a day, so now it's three hundred and sixty, three hundred and eighty Vietnam vets that are dying every day. So our numbers are dwindling out there, you know, and the years go by fast. And there's a lot of stuff that that I I don't even remember about. A boot camp and so forth. You know, I don't know if it's Alzheimer's or what's setting in, but if I, you know, made a uh, effort to just forget it, put it aside, because when I came home, I just put it away. You know, in, in my mind, I just boom, and I came back with a lot of anger. I know I had a lot of anger. I don't know why, but there was a lot of anger in me, and, and it took a while for that to to dissipate, to to leave. You know. But uh, it's true, you, you don't come back the same. When I came back, most of the guys who hadn't gone to Vietnam, my friends, I couldn't even relate to them. I couldn't even talk to them, you know. Most of them want to hear war stories. and you know, What did you do over there? And this and that kind of stuff. And you know, you don't want to sit down and start talking stuff like that. As a matter of fact, even now, some people ask, you know, how many people you kill? How many of this and that stuff? Or what did you see? And you know, those, those kind of things, you just, you really don't want to talk about that. Used to be like the that. first, the first question for most people. When, uh, and this yeah. is when we were a lot younger, maybe drinking a beers. Oh, you were in Vietnam? How many people did you kill? Uh, you know, uh, uh, how do you answer that? Five? Yeah, does, that get, does that satisfy your hand? Was it one, two, ten? How about ten? What, what is the answer? So then you avoid those kinds of, yeah, exactly, of, of, yeah. of situations or people that say, well, you don't act like you're a Vietnam veteran. Well, what am I supposed to act like? I don't understand, you know. Well, what, like I what, told you, at it, first like, we were crazies, you know. We were the crazy vets that came back back in the 60s, you know. Yeah. We were the guys who 
drinking hard and wanting to fight and killing and knives and all that kind of stuff. That's that's the perception that people had of us. But most of us came back and just stood quiet. You know, you just kept it in you. You just didn't talk about it. You know, you just mm -hmm. kind of, like I say, you went, you got a job, you went to work, you got married or did whatever. And that was then, that was back there in the back of your mind and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And, and then, and then on the other thing, we didn't get, uh, thanks, welcome back, none of that stuff. You know, I didn't get spit on, and as, as a matter of fact, but they were calling us baby killers, and that's true, you know. So you weren't welcome back. So like I said, I used to take my uniform off, and uh, I didn't want to wear it. I didn't tell people that I had just come back from Nam or I was in the Marines, or you just, you know, I'd rather tell them I just got out of the joint than telling them I was in the service. So that was... That's how it was, and most of us that came back at that time just just put it aside, you know, just put it inside and locked it away somewhere, you know. And it's good that now that the stuff that Tom does, my nephew, and um, writing about it, getting others to talk, and that is that is good, and people not can start talking about it. And then all of a sudden now we're getting these welcome back from people. I don't I don't even, you know, when they tell me that, God, I don't. I don't like it, you know, so he's welcome back. After 50 years, you're telling me welcome back. Come on, man, you know, so I don't like that to me personally. You should have told me that when I stepped off that ship. The one thing that, that uh, my, my brother came back, right? Like what, 24 hours or something? Or, it was 19, you know, like, 19 hour flight back, yeah. At least, at least for me, I came back by merchant, uh, merchant ship. There was like 250 of us that left Vietnam July 2nd. And one of my daughters was born on July 2nd, as a matter of fact. And I came back, it took me 21, 19 days by ship. So I had all that time to kind of get my head straight. You know what I mean? And we were drinking on the ship and there was a little bit of weed here going around and so forth. But that's, so I kind of got acclimated back into society in a sense. And I remember coming back to the port, I think it was Long Beach. We came back and there was like five little nuns that were walking them, us back. And there was protesters there. But the little five little nuns had said, welcome back, welcome back. And I was tripping out, wow, you know. And uh, that's how it was, you know, it was, that's how it was then, you know. So mm -hmm. we weren't welcome back at all at that time. So now we're getting these welcome back, thanks for your service and all this. Come on, man. You know, to me, it just oh. rolls off my back. Well, we won't, we won't thank you for your service. But <laughs> <laughs> right on. We do, th we do thank you very much for, for participating in this En Casa Con La Plaza session. Again, uh, we've had uh, some people, uh, they joined us a little bit late. If you, if you didn't catch this entire session, uh, we have recorded it. We'll be posting this one in a, in a couple hours. You'll find it on our YouTube page, at La Plaza LA, along with the 80 plus sessions that we've done in the past several months, uh, also on our YouTube page, and it'll also go on our website. Uh, we, we have people, Ruby from, says hi from Valley Village, California, uh, Brittany Walker Pettigrew from Oakland, California, Mario Valdez from Harbor City, uh, people, uh, Edmundo C. Fimbres, very poignant here, it took 25 years before someone, an active duty guy, thanked me for my service, and he, and he cried, he says I cried. Uh, you know, Nancy De Los Santos is asking for your names. We have to Tom Sandoval, we have Manuel Sandoval, and Tomas F. Summer Sandoval with us tonight. Uh, this has been incredible, and we thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll return in Casa Con La Plaza this Friday. A little bit of a lighter thing. We have Dan Guerrero, the, the producer, uh, der, uh, entertainer, actor, Bon Vivant, who'll be with us in his uh, Friday, every other Friday happy hour with uh, Lalo Alcaraz, the writer, um, cartoonist, who's actively trying to find, get that uh, representation in Hollywood, uh, something that was spoken of uh, earlier today. So uh, with that, Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you so much again, SoCal Gas and California Humanities for sponsoring to the La Plaza de Cultura y Artes team who makes these possible. Uh, any final words, uh, Tom? 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, another uh, cathartic, <laughs> cathartic hour and a half or whatever it is. <laughs> I, got some, I think I'm getting hair growing back. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you, Abelardo. Same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love you, brother. Take care of yourself. Mijo, love you too. keep up the good work. All right? Yep. Well, right on. And my little time. It'll always be little time. Tomas, any, any last words here? First of all, it's November 10th, so I should say happy birthday to the Marines. Right on. Right on. <laughs> and tomorrow's Veterans Day, and so happy Veterans to, Day to, to all of you, to your Good families time. as well, because this is part of their story as well. And I, I always say, you know, thank you, not just for your service, but thank you for your sacrifice, right? To me, the real heroism is like in these two guys here. It's not what they did over there 50 years ago, but it's what they've done since, right? And if you've made it to this point, right, you're, you're a hero, every single one of you, so. All right. All right. Thank you, son. All right, and to my sons, Michael and Christopher de la Pena, thank you for your experiences as well and for, for coming back uh, from, from Iraq. And to my granddaughter, Samina, who uh, most recently was in Afghanistan wow. as, a, as a, wow. a helicopter repair person, but now uh, safe in, in uh, Fort, uh, bliss uh outside of el paso so to all the veterans That's out great. there Bye -bye. thank you so much thank you tomas manuel tom all our viewers muchas gracias nos vemos muy pronto bye bye gracias all right